Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's 150th Low Physics webinar. My name is Alejandro, and I'm going to be your host. Today, we are celebrating our series of webinars with a truly extraordinary guest speaker, Juan Maldacena. Renowned as one of the most brilliant minds in theoretical physics, Juan Maldacena has left an indelible mark in all understanding of the universe. As the man behind the game-changing concept of the ADS-CFT correspondence, he has illuminated several connections between gravity, quantum field theory, and string theory. Maldacena's passion for discovery and relentless pursuit of knowledge led him from his studies in Argentina to numerous academic positions at prestigious institutions. With countless honors, including the Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics, Magnacena's groundbreaking insights continue to reshape the landscape, uh, the landscape of modern physics. So please be prepared to be captivated as he takes center stage in this celebratory webinar, sharing his unparalleled wisdom and recent discoveries and perspectives. So as usual, remember you can ask questions over email through YouTube channel or Twitter, and then the questions will be read at the end of the talk. So without further ado, we will turn the time to Juan, and thanks for joining us. Okay, thank you for the very kind introduction. And uh, let me start by, let's say, sharing my screen. Can you see the screen? Perfect, yes, you can go full screen now. And then, okay, wonderful. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. This, uh, we will be discussing uh, the entropy of Hawking radiation. Um, so black holes have been in the news recently. They're, we are in a golden age for black hole observations through uh, various interesting observations. Um, but this talk uh, will be mainly about quantum aspects of black holes. So there are more theoretical aspects, as you will see. So in particular, we will discuss uh, recent progress on the black hole information problem. And this talk is based on a review that we wrote, and uh, you can find it uh, in HEPTH. Um, and it's also this, this, this recent progress was based on two important papers in 2019, one by Pennington and the other by Almeri Engelhardt and Marvin Maxfield. And there are also many previous and follow up papers. And there's another interesting development that I will not review, but is somewhat similar in spirit to what I will talk about. Um, so the outline of this talk is first, I will remind you of how the black hole entropy is equal to the area of the horizon. Then uh, we'll discuss another black hole entropy formula, which is the fine grain gravitational entropy formula, which will say that the entropy is equal to a certain minimal area. So it's the area of some other surface. Um, and then we'll use that formula to compute the entropy of radiation coming out of black holes. And uh, the bottom line is that we'll get a result that is consistent with information conservation as opposed to information loss. So that's the outline of the talk. Now, this talk will not be historical, but hopefully it will be pedagogical. Now, the simplest uh, black hole solution is the Schwarzschild solution or the Schwarzschild metric that Schwarzschild wrote uh, soon after the discovery of general relativity. Uh, it has the following uh, four-dimensional geometry. And um, the most important result about uh, black holes, about quantum aspects of black holes, is that uh, black holes are hot. Black holes have a temperature. So they have a temperature which is uh, proportional to one over uh, four pi RS, where RS is the typical scale size of the black hole. So black holes are characterized by a certain scale called the Schwarzschild radius, uh, which is given in terms of the mass uh, through this formula. Um, and that uh, length scale fixes the uh, length scale uh, associated to the temperature. So the radiation coming out of black holes will have a wavelength which is proportional to RS. So in particular, this phenomenon is so surprising that uh, it can lead to white black holes. So if you have a small enough black hole, the temperature will be high enough, let's say like the temperature of the sun, and uh, that black hole will look white to our eyes. So we would have a white black hole. Um, now, let me just remind you how let me remind you of the derivation of this formula. Um, and before we discuss black holes, let's just, uh, I would like to remind you of a connection between finite temperatures and circles in Euclidean time. 
So let's imagine you have a quantum system and you're considering the partition function of the quantum system is given by the trace of e to the minus beta h. And you can think of this, um, of this canonical partition function as evolution in Euclidean time on a circle of length beta. So if we had here i t h, that would be ordinary Lorentzian evolution. Uh, but because we don't have the i, we have, uh, that's the same as going to imaginary time. And so we have an evolution in imaginary time over a time of order beta. And we are taking the trace, so we're identifying the, the initial and final state and summing over all of them. And that's equivalent to considering the theorem a circle on a Euclidean time circle of length beta. Okay. Now this is true for any quantum system. Uh, it's true for a harmonic oscillator, for it's true for you know a two-level system, for for any for any system. It's true if we take a quantum field theory and so on. Um, so the point is that the theorem on a Euclidean circle is related to a system in thermal equilibrium at, at a certain temperature, which is uh, given by one over the size of the circle. So that's a general uh, feature. So now let's uh, consider a Euclidean uh, black hole. So let's consider, let's start with the Lorentzian black hole, the metric that Schwarzschild wrote, which is uh, written here. And now let's consider the Euclidean time version of that. So we, all we are doing is just simply taking t to i t Euclidean. And that has the result of changing the sign in front of this term from this minus disappears. And now we have a plus. Now, here um, we see that uh, the, the, where the horizon was before. So now we have a situation where this, the coefficient of this term in the metric is uh, shrinking to zero. Um, and this is somewhat similar to what happens in uh, Euclidean time, uh, sorry, what happens in just Euclidean space if we write it in terms of polar coordinates that the length of the, let's say, angular direction could shrink to zero. And that can be non-singular if uh, we adjust uh, properly the length of the Euclidean time direction. So we can adjust the length of the Euclidean time direction if we make beta, so the length of Euclidean time uh, equal to two pi r s, then we find that uh, this metric is completely non-singular. And the radial and time directions uh, combine in order to give a space which has the topology essentially of a cigar. So at each position, at, at each radial position, we have a circle um, whose proper length is given by this, proper length square is given by this formula. Um, and then when we get uh, to r equal to rs, it shrinks smoothly as if it was the origin of the Euclidean plane. Okay. Now, on, on each point um, of this, uh, so th this is a four-dimensional geometry, and over each point of this two-dimensional space, there is also a two-dimensional sphere whose size is also changing and has a minimal value, minimal non-zero value uh, here at uh, r equal to rs. Okay. So that's uh, the Euclidean black hole. And uh, given that uh, we have the circle, we can. the idea is to interpret uh, this geometry as the geometry of a black hole in thermal equilibrium uh, with some system outside at temperature beta. So, uh, so the fact that it's non-singular is interpreted as saying that if we, you, put the, um, you, you put the black hole in contact with a thermal, let's say, gas at temperature beta, this will be a thermal equilibrium situation. So this is the simple way to derive the entropy of the temperature of the black hole. And that's a derivation uh, discussed by Gibbons and Hawking. Now, once you have the formula for the temperature, you can derive a formula for the entropy by using the first law of thermodynamics. So that the small variation in the entropy is given by uh, small variation in the energy over T and the energy is equal to the mass. And we have the, connection between the mass and the temperature. So we can integrate this formula to find that the entropy is equal to uh, the area of the horizon over 4G Newton. Of course, uh, historically, previously, Bekenstein had conjecture a similar formula for the entropy without the precise numerical factor. But Hawking's derivation of the temperature gave us the precise formula for the entropy of the black hole. Um, now here I've set uh, h bar and c and Boltzmann constant equal to one. Um, and this was down to, you can also rewrite this as um, the area divided by four L Planck square. 
And L. Planck is very small. Uh, so this entropy is very large for a microscopic black hole. So we see that the black hole is a thermodynamic object uh, and obeys the laws of thermodynamics. And, and, and this is definitely surprising. Um, so now we'll discuss a bit more in detail, the, in, in a bit more detail, the geometry of a black hole. So um, let's discuss the geometry of a black hole made from collapse. And this is something that was first discussed by Oppenheimer and Snyder in the well, 1940, roughly. Um, so they consider uh, a star that was collapsing into a black hole, or more precisely, let's say a ball of dust that collapses into a black hole. And we, we represent uh, these geometries through something that is called the Penrose diagram. So these are some diagrams that th they characterize the geometry. Now, throughout this talk, we'll be considering spherically symmetric geometries. So, and we will forget about the directions of the sphere. So at each point on this diagram, there will be a two-dimensional sphere. Um, but these diagrams will only include the radial and time direction. So these diagrams represent the radial and time direction of the four-dimensional geometry. And they, th th that geometry has been rescaled so as to fit it on the page but in such a way that angles has, are preserved and the direction of light rays are at 45 degrees. So a, a light ray, an outgoing radially, uh, so the light ray that goes out in a radial direction uh, would be moving here at 45 degrees and incoming light ray will be moving in this direction. So this uh, region here corresponds to the region that was, is infinitely far away in the four dimensional space. And we rescale all that infinitely far away distance to some finite location in the diagram. Here, uh, the point r equal to zero, which would be the the, the center of the space, uh, that, that's the only that's the place where the two sphere shrinks to zero, but in a smooth way. So that's um, that's this vertical line. And here, uh, roughly speaking, this direction is roughly like time, and this direction is roughly like space. Um, and the surface of the star in this diagram uh, follows this trajectory and ends up in a place which we call the singularity. So singularity is a situation, it's a place where the curvature of the space-time uh, goes to infinity. Okay, So we cannot continue to evolve the equations uh, beyond this point. So this is a point where general relativity breaks down. Um, and then um, if we consider outgoing light rays, so if you have a light ray that starts from here, and uh, it goes out, so it can go out through the surface of the star and go all the way to infinity. But if you have a light ray that comes out from here and it starts going out, it uh, will end up at the singularity. So the space-time is divided into regions from which you can send a signal to the outside, such as this region uh, down here, and a region where you cannot escape to the outside, where even if you go out at the speed of light, you uh, cannot avoid falling into the singular or get into the singularity. And the singularity is really into your future. So it's a bit like a cosmological big crunch singularity in this region of the space time. And there is a surface and let's say imaginary surface, nothing special happens to you when you cross the surface, uh, but there is the surface that we call the horizon and is generated by all the, by the light rays that neither go to infinity nor fall into the singularity. So this is like a, a separating surface between the light rays that uh, go to the infinity and the light rays that uh, fall into the singularity. Okay, so that's uh, the geometry of a black hole made from collapse. Um, and as I said, this was understood in 1939. Now there is something interesting that happens with this geometry, uh, which is that if you, if you look at the area of the horizon, so here, uh, this is r equal to zero, the area of this uh, surface. This is a, if you look at the surface at some moment in time, it's a two dimensional surface. It covers the two sphere, but this two sphere uh, has a zero size here and it has a size which steadily increases until it gets to the surface of the star. And then after that, it remains constant. And it's given by uh, the area of the horizon of the just Schwarzschild geometry, which is given in terms of the Schwarzschild radius. So here we start, we see that it starts with a small area, it increases, and then it reaches some maximum. Now it turns out that uh, it, it was proven uh, that 
um, the area of a black hole horizon always increases, not only in this uh, simple situation, but even in complicated situations, such as, for example, two colliding black holes and so on. And uh, it's a consequence of the equations of general relativity that uh, the area of the horizon increases. And uh, this is in agreement with uh, the second law of thermodynamics. So if we interpret the horizon as some entropy, then uh, Einstein equations are implying the second law of thermodynamics. Now, the, the, the full entropy, um, so it was a concept of uh, generalized entropy that was introduced by Bekenstein. And his idea was that the whole entropy of the universe outside the black hole uh, would be the entropy of matter, which is uh, the, the obvious contribution to the entropy, uh, plus the area of the horizon. And that's uh, the total contribution of the entropy if you are outside. In particular, you are not including the entropy of matter inside the black hole horizon but you uh, have to include this uh, area of the horizon uh, formula, okay? And um, now one question you might have is the following. So when, when a black hole emits Hawking radiation, it uh, loses energy. So its area becomes smaller. Now you can ask uh, what happens to the entropy. Naively, you would think that if the entropy is dominated by the area and the area becomes smaller, uh, then you might be in danger of violating the second law of thermodynamics. Now, for this, you need to remember that the full formula includes also the entropy of matter. And this entropy includes the entropy of quantum fields outside the horizon. And, um, and when uh, you uh, have the process of Hawking evaporation, uh, it's true that the area decreases, but the entropy of the fields outside because of the radiation, uh, it, it increases. And uh, it turns out that uh, the entropy of radiation increases more than the decrease of the area. So actually, this full entropy increases uh, through the process of black hole evaporation. So it's an irreversible process, which increases the, this thermodynamic entropy. Now, in fact, one can prove, uh, one can prove that the, this full entropy obeys the second law of thermodynamics. And this was done relatively recently by Aaron Wall in the 2010s. And the only thing you need to assume to prove this is that the matter obeys, it's relativistic and it's given by a relativistic quantum field theory. There was a long discussion uh, from the time of Bekenstein till 2010, actually continued after 2010 because some people did not read this paper, uh, of trying, of imagining that, um, that the second law of black hole thermodynamics might impose some constraint on matter or imagining uh, thought experiments that might or might not violate the uh, the second law, and they, they would find that, uh, well, there is a miracle that makes it obeyed. But now we understand all, all of that, and uh, it's all a consequence of uh, relativistic quantum field theory. Okay, so these results have uh, inspired the very influential hypothesis that we, we are going to call the central dogma in the study of quantum aspects of black holes, and, and it's the following. So it's the idea that uh, if you look at the black hole from the outside, then uh, a black hole can be described as a quantum system with uh, s degrees of freedom or s qubits, where s is the area uh, over 40 newton. Um, and furthermore, this uh, degrees of freedom evolve according to unitary evolution as uh, seen from the outside. So that's, uh, that's this uh, idea. Now, we, we are calling it the dogma. Dogma means uh, hypothesis, and it's something that is uh, cannot be, well, we don't know how to prove it from the equations of general relativity. Um, it's uh, uh, some, some assumption. Um, so it requires a certain, uh, well, certain degree of faith also in the sense that you might believe or not believe in this. And some people think it's wrong and some people uh, think it's correct. So now in other words, uh, if we include um, some area over 4G Newton mysterious qubits, then uh, the black hole can be described as an ordinary quantum system. So more precisely, if you imagine you have some imaginary surface that surrounds the black hole, uh, we can replace the black hole and the whole space-time within this imaginary surface by some system of ordinary qubits uh, that are evolving according to some Hamiltonian. So the only thing we know about the Hamiltonian is that it's a Hamiltonian that is acting on these qubits. Um, and it's, it's unitary. 
Of course, it's an open system because it's this the degrees of freedom in here can interact with the outside. But the non-trivial hypothesis is that there are no extra degrees of freedom somehow behind the black hole horizon that this um, qubits can interact with. The, these qubits take full account of the degrees, any possible degrees of freedom behind the horizon. And so, well, or, or at least any degrees of freedom that are necessary to describe the black hole from the outside. So that's uh, the that's the idea. So now this, if if you make this assumption, then you can reinterpret this uh, computation that Gibbons and Hawking did, um, which is a uh, they computed some the action of gravity, and you can think of that um, the action, the, the gravitational action of this geometry as giving you the partition function of those mysterious degrees of freedom with that mysterious Hamiltonian that we don't know. So the left-hand side is somehow some hypothesis. And the idea is that this gravitational computation, which is a purely geometric computation done solving Einstein's equations, has the interpretation as the trace over some mysterious uh, Hilbert space. So this gives us the answer, but it does not tell us exactly what this black hole so-called microstates are. Now, let me just tell you some evidence for, for this hypothesis. Um, so there is some evidence from the so-called entropy counting. So there are some special black holes in special theories that have supersymmetry that can be counted precisely using in string theory using D brains. And this counting reproduces the area formula and not only the area formula, but also corrections such as this uh, entropy of, of the fields outside and, and further uh, corrections uh, that exist to this formula. Um, this was initially done by Strominger and Buffa, and there were many other papers and lots of recent developments on this, on, the, on, on pre very precise matchings of this kind. This is for, typically is for special extremal black holes that you can get most control of over this calculation. Another piece of evidence is the ADSC FT correspondence, which uh, says that if you have a Physics in ADS is the same as uh, a field theory or a conformal field theory on the boundary. And what that says is that if you have a black hole, that black hole is described by a hot fluid of particles at the boundary. So this is a situation similar to what we discussed before, um, except that in this case, we actually know what the Hamiltonian is. So in some special cases, we have a very explicit description of the Hamiltonian. And it's a situation where that cutoff surface that we uh, discussed before is pushed all the way to infinity in space, so all the way to the boundary of the ADS space. And we are describing uh, not only the black hole, but the whole space time around it using this, uh, this degrees of freedom. So you can view this as a special case of what we did, that central dogma we talked about before. However, so these are, these are some evidence in favor, but there was also some evidence against. Um, and so in 1976, Hawking said that this uh, couldn't be true. And so let's uh, review his argument. So his argument is based on considering the geometry of an evaporating black hole that was made from collapse. So this is the Penrose diagram. It's very similar to the diagram that we uh, were discussing before. Um, so we have again the star that collapses and now we are going to in include the Hawking radiation. So we can think of the Hawking radiation as uh, arising from entangled pairs that were there in the vacuum. So the vacuum, if you take the full uh, slice, the full geometric slice, let's say on one of these green uh, surfaces, it's a pure quantum state. Um, but the horizon divides into two parts, divides that state into two parts. And um, at the short distances, uh, the vacuum of quantum field theory uh, has some entanglement. And uh, you can think of that as arising from pairs of particles that are entangled with each other. And so um, one of the members of the pairs can go out to infinity and become the Hawking radiation. And the other member of the pair uh, will uh, go into the singularity. So the two members together are forming a pure state. But if you only uh, see uh, one of the members, uh, you'll find a, a, a mixed state. So if you, so on each of these green slices, you have a pure state. But if you, the black hole evaporates completely, we think that after black hole evaporation, uh, the Penrose diagram will look like this, which this is looks basically like the Penrose diagram in flat space, where this vertical line is just are equal to zero. 
then uh, a slice drawn uh, through that part of the diagram will only uh, intersect with the um, with the members of the Hawking radiation and will not uh, have anything but will not contain the interior and so the entropy on this slice uh, of the quantum fields will be non-zero uh, while the entropy uh, on this initial slice could have been zero if the star was in a pure state even if the star is not in a pure state this entropy would be much bigger it would be an entropy which is proportional to the area of the horizon just but it's even bigger than the area of the horizon after the black hole forms um, which is bigger than the entropy of the initial star so we, we have some net increase in entropy okay this does not violate the the of course the second law of thermodynamics but it does um, violate the idea of unitarity that uh, if this entropy is really the full fine grain entropy of the system we went from a situation where we have low entropy to a situation with large uh, fine grain entropy. So this is uh, another uh, point of view of on, on the same of, of the same stuff. So um, this arises by thinking of this somehow slightly complicated diagram uh, in the following way. So we had the matter produces a second uh, baby universe, so that in the large uh, at large times uh, we have. The original universe filled with uh, some Hawking radiation. Um, and then we have a second universe, which would be this whole interior, uh, which collapses, collapses into a singularity. So it's a baby universe, a big, very big, uh, we can call it a teenage universe. So it's a big baby universe. Um, and it causes some problems for the parent universes, some problems with, about with unitarity. And um, yeah, and so, so from this point of view, you say, well, uh, this is an evolution from some single universe into two separate universes. And well, they could be entangled with each other. So that if you take both of them, they're in a pure state. So the full evolution is unitary. But if you only look at the parent universe, then uh, you have some net increase in entropy. This is similar to a particle that uh, decays into two particles uh, that are entangled. If you only look at one particle, you find a non-zero entropy. But if you look at the two particles together, you have zero entropy. So from this point of view, uh, it uh, seems rather natural that uh, you, you could have some increase in entropy. And this is was uh, Hawking's point of view. So now uh, we'll, we'll make a slightly better statement of the problem that uh, is due to Page. Um, and the idea is to compute the entropy of the radiation as the radiation comes out of the black hole. So we start uh, t equal to zero, the black hole forms, and then uh, we start collecting the Hawking radiation. At first, uh, we have a small amount of photons, and then we'll have more and more. And as we have more and more, the entropy of the Hawking radiation will uh, steadily increase until the black hole evaporates completely. Now, it, it, that need not be a straight line. It might be a curved line. What, what's important here is that, um, that it increases monotonically and it stops increasing after the black hole evaporates completely. So that's uh, what Hawking's calculation tells us. On the other hand, the thermodynamic entropy of the black hole, which is given by the area of the horizon, um, after the black hole forms, it will be given by the area of the horizon. And then uh, that entropy starts uh, decreasing and it decreases all the way to zero. Okay. Now that area of the horizon, it's, it's a measure of how many uh, degrees of freedom the black hole has. And um, so at these very early times, it might be that the entropy of Hawking radiation is increasing because it's entangled with the black hole degrees of freedom. But there will be a contradiction at this point where um, the entropy of Hawking radiation is bigger than the area of the black hole horizon. So this entropy cannot possibly arise from entanglement with this black hole degrees of freedom. So the contradiction with that uh, central dogma, central hypothesis, doesn't happen when the black hole evaporates completely, but it happens already at this point. This point is called the page time, uh, when uh, the entropy of Hawking radiation uh, becomes equal to the thermodynamic entropy of the black hole or the area of the horizon. So that's the point where we have a contradiction. So what Page said was that if uh, unitarity is to be preserved, then the actual uh, entropy of the radiation should not follow the green curve, but it should follow this uh, purple curve that we see here. So it, should, it could rise up to here, so that would be consistent, but then it necessarily has to go down 
and it can be at most uh, equal to this quantity. Okay, so that's uh, that's the idea. So this uh, here we assume that the uh, black hole was formed with a very low entropy state or zero entropy state. Um, so this is uh, the purple curve is what's expecting from unitarity. Now it, it's important that this problem involves understanding the fine grain entropy. Um, so I, I remind you that there are two notions of entropy. So there is the fine grain entropy or von Neumann entropy, uh, which remains constant under time evolution. It's given by minus trace of rho log rho, where rho is the density matrix of the system. So if the system is evolving according to unitary evolution, um, this doesn't change. And then uh, th this will be the entropy that we'll be mainly talking about uh, in the rest of the talk. Now there's also the coarse grain entropy and sometimes called thermodynamic entropy or Boltzmann entropy. And this is the entropy that obeys the second law. So it was introduced uh, by Boltzmann in, in his discussion of the second law. And in some sense, it arises from some sloppiness. It's the fact that we are forgetting to measure some things in the system. And it is somewhat subtle to define it precisely. And we are only here mentioning it to distinguish it from the star of our show, which is this actual entropy, the von Neumann entropy. Um, it has some precise definition that I'm not going to discuss. Now, we, 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 let's just see the difference between these two entropies uh, in an example. Um, imagine that um, the, 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 this, these two entropies are typically different in out of equilibrium situations. So uh, let me let me show show it to you in an example. Imagine you have a big box, and within the big box you have a small box, and you have some gas in the small box. Okay. Then at the time equal to zero, you open the small box. This is a unitary process, and the particles come out of the small box and fill the big box, okay? Now, if we had some density matrix describing the initial particles, then uh, the final density matrix is just the unitary transformation of the initial one, and the final entropy will be equal to the initial entropy, okay? Because you can um, you can remove this u and u minus one from this formula using the cyclic property of the trace. On the other hand, uh, if you compute the thermodynamic entropy, of uh, of a gas in a bigger box, it, it will be bigger. Okay, so thermodynamic entropy um, is assuming that well, you you know that the gas is in the big box, but you don't know that it came from this particular uh, state. So uh, the, the, there are many more states possible for the the gas in the big box than in a smaller box. That's why it increases, and I'm calling it thermodynamic here because that's the entropy that increases according to the thermodynamic uh, second law sometimes also called, as I said, Boltzmann entropy. Um, now, for the moment, we'll be talking about the entropy of the black hole as seen from the outside. And so this would be the entropy of the quantum system that appeared in this central hypothesis or central dogma that we mentioned before. So that's the entropy we are going to be computing in the next uh, few slides, the von Neumann entropy of that. Now, the, the horizon area uh, is computing a thermodynamic entropy or, or Boltzmann-like entropy. Just uh, and we can ask how how to compute the fine grained one. Um, now the, the the reason that the the horizon area is computing the thermodynamic entropy is that we saw that when a black hole collapses, uh, that's a fairly rapid process. Uh, that's essentially unitary because there is no much chance of emission of Hawking radiation and so on. And um, and we saw that the entropy increases dramatically because the area of the horizon increases uh, from zero to something big. Okay. So um, the question is, uh, we have some nice formula for the horizon area and this well-known formula for the black hole entropy. And the question is where there is one that computes the, um, the von Neumann entropy. Now, the interesting thing is that there, are, there is actually a formula for the candidate formula for the von Neumann entropy. Um, and it's somewhat similar to the uh, black hole entropy formula in the sense that it involves an area and some entropy outside that area. So basically there's some area of some surface, which we are calling, going to call X. And there is, let's say this is a surface, it's a, it's a point on this diagram, but remember that each point on the diagram is a two dimensional sphere. So that's a two dimensional surface. And then we consider the three dimensional slice outside the surface. And we have this blue, blue line here, 
represents this cut of surface outside the black hole. So we're surrounding the black hole with a big surface and we're going to consider the entropy of everything that is inside. Um, so we go all the way up to some surface X, we consider the entropy of all the quantum fields here or, or any kind of matter entropy we can have here. Uh, that's uh, this piece of my classical entropy of the quantum fields. And then uh, we add the area of the horizon and this uh, full quantity then um, is minimized over the choice of the surface X. So now we are going to start moving the surface X both in the space direction and in the time direction, keeping this uh, surface space-like. And we're going to find the point X which extremizes uh, this. So typically it's a minimum in this direction and maximum in the vertical direction, the time direction. So we extremize and we find some extrema. And there might be situations where there's more than one extremum. And then we are supposed to minimize over all those extrema. So that's uh, the procedure. So uh, that's the procedure we are supposed to follow. So it's a bit like, uh, it's, it's, it's very similar and for reasons we'll discuss later to let's say finding the extreme of an action and then minimizing the action. Um, anyway, th this, this formula was developed in, in a bunch of papers and uh, the last paper has uh, now this final formula that we're going to use. Um, now we'll discuss the derivation of this formula later. For now, we will just use it. I'm, I'm going to show you some examples on how to use it. And you, you should be somewhat, you should be surprised by the claim that there is a formula for the fine grain entropy because for ordinary physical systems, we don't have a, a simple formula for the fine grain entropy. It's something quite difficult to compute. So, and difficult to measure also. But let me show you some examples. So imagine that you have the full extended Penrose diagram of uh, the Schwarzschild solution. So that's the solution that describes really two black holes. So there is has one exterior, this is the exterior of one black hole, this is the exterior of the other black hole, and they're connected through the interior, sometimes uh, through the so-called Einstein-Rosen bridge. But anyway, so that's uh, the full geometry in that case. And if we surround one black hole by cut of surface and compute the, um, the entropy inside, uh, the extremal surface will be here uh, at, uh, when the past and future horizon meet, and the area will be just the area of the black hole. So this is a situation where the, 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 the this surface that we find is actually at the horizon. So in this case, the two notions of entropy agree with each other, and that's also consistent with the idea that this geometry, if you look at only one of the black holes, represents a black hole in thermal equilibrium. So in thermal equilibrium, the two notions of entropy agree with each other. Now we can go and look at uh, the case of a collapsing black hole. So this is uh, again, the same diagram that we had before of the collapsing black hole. And now um, if we try to minimize uh, the, general, the, the, en the generalized entropy, so the area plus the entropy outside, we find that there is a minimum where the area of that surface X is actually zero. So the, the, that area might actually be zero. And in that case, uh, we have no contribution from the area, but we have some contribution of, from the entropy of matter fields. And in this case, you see that if the star had some entropy, the uh, entropy on the surface would be the entropy of the star. So in this case, the fine grain entropy is giving us the entropy of the star. Notice that uh, in this particular case, if we were to calculate the uh, area of the horizon at this point, it will give us the area of the horizon, which is which in general much bigger than the uh, entropy of the star. So if we compute the thermodynamic entropy or the Bekenstein Hawking entropy, that will um, increase and will be large. Uh, while if we compute the fine grain entropy is equal to the entropy of the star, the same entropy we would have had uh, if we had computed it before the black hole forms. So this formula for the entropy is manifestly in agreement with the idea that um, the entropy uh, doesn't change under unitary evolution, as we, we had discussed before. Okay, so now um, we'll, we'll consider an evaporating black hole. And so uh, when we have an evaporating black hole, um, we can start uh, computing this entropy at later times. Now there will be Hawking radiation. The Hawking radiation will leave uh, this cut of surface, so the entropy inside could start changing. And um, and we, we will always have a solution, which is uh, this solution with vanishing entropy. And that uh, will give us some entropy for the black hole that will start increasing, similar to what we saw before for the radiation. 
But these two new papers contain a new observation, which is the idea that there is a second uh, extremal surface that uh, is kind of close to the horizon. Uh, it's, um, it's a surface that arises due to some equilibrium between the uh, gradients, let's say, of the, the area and the, the gradients of the entropy of, uh, of the quantum fields. And it, it's kind of close to the horizon. And uh, its area is, is close to the area of the horizon. So if we, if we consider now the two candidate surfaces, so there are two extremal surfaces. One was this one that had vanishing area that exists for all times. And in this case, what happens is that as the Hawking radiation leaves the system, then we start getting a, a larger and larger entropy that is coming from the entropy of these uh, partners of Hawking radiation. Okay, so the, the, if, if uh, you catch somehow, for example, um, on this surface, we here have uh, one of the members, one of the members of the pair, and we are missing this member, so we have some non-zero entropy. Um, on this surface, we have two of the members we are missing this one, so the entropy will start increasing. On the other hand, uh, here we have um, we have this other second extremal surface, which um, which um, which will follow track basically closely the area of the horizon, and so it will give us this other possible entropy, which actually will decrease in time. Um, so the 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 prescription is telling us that we should choose the minimal one. So for some time, we'll choose this one. And when the two become equal, we choose uh, the other one. So we get some curve that basically looks similar to the page curve, but in this case, we're computing the entropy of the black hole. So we get something similar to the page curve for the black hole, but we really wanted the page curve for the radiation. Now, the radiation lives in a region where the quantum gravity effects could be very small. It could have left this anti sitter space. It could be collected in a far away quantum computer. However, since we obtain the state using gravity, we should apply this uh, fine grain gravitational entropy formula uh, to compute its entropy. And so in particular, so we had this cut of surface, we have now the radiation lives in the region outside this uh, cut of surface. And uh, we try to compute the entropy of this region. But the idea is that if we want to compute the entropy of this region here outside, we in principle should allow some other surfaces with um, connected to another spatial slice. And now uh, compute the entropy. when we compute the entropy of the radiation, we should also include the entropy of the quantum fields on this slice plus the area of this surface. Now, you might wonder why might it be convenient for you to uh, include this region? So the idea is that um, if uh, there is a lot of entropy here, but this entropy comes from entanglement with quantum fields that live in the interior, then we could decrease the entropy by including uh, this portion of the slice, uh, well, this part of the slice. We pay a price, which is the area of the surface, but if there is a lot of entropy here, this price to pay might uh, be uh, good enough in the sense that uh, the area of the surface might be smaller than uh, the entropy of the fields outside, so we might get some reduction in the total entropy or this uh, minimum there could be important. So we call this region here an island. This is a region that arises purely in, uh, in the calculation of the entropy. Um, and then uh, for the same reason, we found an extremal surface in the previous calculation. We also find an extremal surface here close to the horizon in this calculation. And um, it's important that this, in this formula, there are two entropies. One is the entropy of the semi-classical fields in this background. And the other one is supposed to be the entropy of the exact radiation state. So there's some exact radiation state that exists in the full theory of quantum gravity. Um, and the idea is that the, we can get an approximation, an approximate formula for that exact entropy by computing, uh, by using this formula. Uh, which is computed using the leading order semi-classical geometry, which is this uh, black hole solution. Now, if the initial matter state is pure, then the quantum extremal surfaces or these surfaces that extremize the, the, that appear in the definition are the same as the ones we discussed before. And then we get the page curve for the Hawking radiation. So we, we had success in computing the entropy of Hawking radiation in a way that you get a result that is consistent with unitarity. 
Now, the, the skeptic will complain and will just say, well, this is just an accounting trick. Uh, they would say, I have always said that if you include the black hole interior, uh, then the state is pure. And with this prescription, we are including the black hole interior. So, um, so, so that, uh, that seems to be a problem. And the information problem arises because you don't have access to the interior. So that's what uh, they would say. However, we should not view this as an accounting trick, but a bit like an oracle. So it is some formula that can be derived from the gravitational path integral. Um, it can, I, I didn't discuss the derivation. I'll, I'll discuss it in a second. So we will discuss how we can derive that the formulas that we discussed so far from a first principles gravitational path integral discussion. And it's an oracle in the sense that it gives us the true fine grain entropy of the exact state, but uh, or at least an approximation to that entropy, but only using the semi-classical state. Um, so let me now say a few words about uh, deriving this uh, formula we, that we've been talking about. The idea is that it is conceptually similar to the derivation of the black hole entropy using the Euclidean black hole. So I'll, I'll remind you first of the derivation given by Gibbons and Hawking of the Euclidean black hole. So the idea was to start uh, with this Euclidean black hole and then um, compute the gravitational action, which is given by the action of gravity and then the action of quantum fields living on this geometry. This is completely smooth and clear. Um, and then you interpret this as uh, e to the minus beta h. So if you interpret it this way, then the entropy associated to this partition function is just given by one minus beta dd beta of logarithm of c. So that's the standard thermodynamic formula. Um, and then it can be argued by using the equations of gravity. Uh, I'm not presenting the argument, but it can be argued that if you change uh, the length of the circle uh, and you form this uh, combination, the change in the gravitational action will basically come mainly from some region near this, uh, near the horizon, and will give us a formula equal to the area of the horizon. And uh, this semi-classical partition function of quantum fields will give us uh, the entropy. So this, this formula will reduce to the entropy of the, the standard entropy of the semi-classical fields on the spectrum. So we get the formula that we were discussing before. Now, we can think of this formula in the following way. So imagine that uh, we do the Euclidean uh, path integral on a circle, but not a closed circle, and, but an open circle. Um, so we can think of this as defining a, a density matrix um, that has the two, the two entries of the left and right entries of the density matrices are the, these lies here in the past and the future. Um, this is not something we know how to do very precisely, but we could do this computation. It's an unnormalized density matrix. That, that's what the tilde means. Um, and then uh, if we wanted to calculate the entropy, uh, we could take n copies of this density matrix, raise it to the power n. Um, now, when we, when we raise it to the power n and we close the circle, then that has a well-defined geometrical description. And then if we manage to analytically continue in n, we can uh, then calculate the entropy. So a formula similar to the one we had before. Um, so um, now, if in this case that we have a U1 symmetry, this is just identical to the previous formula we discussed before, changing beta is the same as changing n continuously. Um, however, uh, with this description, we can also consider situations which are not symmetric. So let's say a situation which differs by a little bit compared to the previous one where we do a little bump uh, here in the evolution. Little bump means uh, we change the boundary conditions for the fields or for gravity and so on. We introduce extra let's say gravitational waves or waves of scalar field into the geometry. So it gives a time dependent uh, geometry. And then, uh, so this is Euclidean time. We could consider continuations of this to Lorentzian signature if we wanted. Um, but <clears throat> in this case, uh, we could define a new density matrix and we could uh, then define also integer powers of traces of integer powers of this density matrix by uh, considering the same path integral with the same boundary conditions, but let's say repeated three times, and with the condition that in the interior, uh, the geometry is non-singular. So similar to the condition we had for the gibbons hawking discussion. So in this case, we can do this for any integers. We can even analytically continue this uh, computation for, for fractional powers here. And 
then uh, do this computation. And when we do this, we find that um, the, the entropy computed in this way uh, reduces to the entropy that, that we had before. So roughly speaking, what is happening is that when you analytically continue in this power, you get a small conical singularity here, which um, is a bit like a cosmic string whose action is proportional to the area. And that's where roughly where the area term comes from. But so the, the, the bottom line is that uh, this formula that looked a little bit mysterious uh, can be derived from uh, this discussion. And the fact that here we should minimize and extremize and so on um, is related to the fact that we get a kind of cosmic string here. Um, and uh, we need to, um, a part of imposing the Einstein equations is um, sort of minimizing the, the energy of that, the action of that cosmic string. And that involves uh, minimizing the area or extremizing the area. So that's uh, where this extreme and minimum come from. So in the same way that the Euclidean black hole gives us the entropy, this uh, re so-called replica trick gives us the gravitational fine grain entropy formula. And if the state was prepared by Euclidean path integral, then, and it has dynamical gravity only in some regions, we should apply, uh, we should allow various topologies in that region. So in particular, uh, the interiors could be connected by replica formulas, and that gives rise to that island formula that we discussed. So that is also derived uh, from, let's say, the gravitational path integral. Um, let me see, do I have time to discuss this? So, um, well, let me not discuss it. Um, so let me skip all of this. Um, so part of the conclusions is that we reviewed the gravitational fine grain entropy formula and we applied it to the computation of the entropy of Hawking radiation and we obtained results that are consistent with unitarity. And at late times, most of the interior is part of the radiation. It's not, not really part of the black hole degrees of freedom. Um, now the question is, what was uh, black Hawking's mistake? Um, the idea is that he was not using the fine grain gravitational entropy formula. He was using something that was more similar to the thermodynamic entropy. So a lot of what was discussed was derived by thinking about aspects of ADSFT, which itself involves some string theory, but you only need to know gravity as an effective field theory to apply these formulas. So you don't need to know anything particular about ADSFT or string theory. You only need to know the, the gravitational path integral uh, to apply these formulas. And so this is an amazingly deep connection between gravity and quantum mechanics. Um, now, the question is uh, whether the information puzzle is solved. And I would say that one aspect of it is it is indeed solved, which is the aspect of computing the entropy. So from a gravitational computation, purely gravitational computation, uh, we computed the entropy. But however, another aspect, which is to understand what state comes out of the black hole evaporation. So we have a black hole and it evaporates. We like some formula uh, purely using gravity of what the state is. And that uh, we don't know how to derive from gravity. We could derive it using ADSFT, but we, we don't know how to describe it from gravity. So from that, from gravity, we don't have a complete understanding. Um, so we can compute the entropy of the radiation, but not exactly the state that the radiation is in. It's a little funny. So the computation for the entropy does not go through first computing the density matrix and then computing the trace, but um, it involves uh, through expressions that involve computing the trace of powers of the density matrix. So you never have access directly to the density matrix. Now, as, it, as was the case for the black hole entropy, this is a bit like an accounting oracle that gives us the uh, explicit, um, so, so the explicit representation of the states is still mysterious. Um, and the semi-classical solution is representing only some aspects of the state, but enough aspects that allows us to compute the, the entropy itself. Now for the future, we can ask what further lessons this is teaching us about the black hole interior and the singularity. Uh, and we hope that this new understanding might have some implications for cosmology, though that remains something to be done in the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Juan, for this amazing webinar. Let me just see if we have some questions here. Let me talk about doing this. Okay. So before I open the mic for people here, 
let me, I see there's already a question. Let me just read this uh, that I received. Could you please explain again, what are these quantum extremal surfaces and if the, they are unique? Yes. Um, okay, let me go back. Um, okay, um, go back to the definition. Um, well, first of all, they are not unique because we, we saw that uh, in some cases there were two choices. Uh, but the quantum extremal surface is the surface that minimizes uh, this quantity. So the area of the surface plus the entropy in this slice that goes from the surface to some cutoff surface far away. Okay. Um, so this is some quantity. So this thing here within the brackets is something that depends on what the surface is. And then you can extremize uh, this quantity, if you find an extreme one, that's called quantum extremal surface. Okay, thank you. There is a, a delay, so I'll, I'll let you know if there's a follow-up question. Um, so I see uh, Anna Romano, you, you, you can open your mic, I, I think, and ask the question. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Marasena, for your uh, Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, for your very interesting talk, and uh, I have a, I have a question regarding your final remark about connection to cosmology. Um, yes. So, so uh, the 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 so-called continuity question uh, can be interpreted as the first law of thermodynamics. So, is the is this the kind of connection that you could make uh, when you're um, in when you were talking about this at the end? Um, I, I I didn't understand. So so the, there there is of course um, a connection in the sitter space between the area of the horizon. So, so the area of the the sitter horizon or or even a cosmological horizon in general, first of all obeys the second law and uh, and perhaps uh, could be representing some entropy. Let's say at least uh, perhaps the thermodynamic entropy or Boltzmann entropy that is accessible to an observer. Yes who lives uh, to, to an observer in that space. Um, but uh, we don't know what whether um, whether it represents, let's say, fine grain entropy or uh, so a similar notion for fine grain entropy is not known. So let, let me just say it that way. Uh, OK, so, so in that case, about, uh, if you naively think about the fine grain entropy for that observer, you would say it's zero. Uh, because uh, the similar prescription would tell you that uh, the surface, so let's say you find a surface around in yourself as an observer, and then you can shrink it to zero in the other, in the other, and um, in the antipode of the spatial section of the sitter space, uh, which is a three sphere. Um, and so you would get, you would get zero. Okay, so in that case, the, the cosmological horizon would play the role of the uh, structural horizon of the, of the black hole. Yeah, it would be similar to the horizon of a black hole. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Let, Let me say it in a slightly different way. So in the case of black holes, we have a fairly well accepted sort of central dogma or hypothesis of how we are supposed to think about black holes. Uh, we don't have a similar hypothesis for the case of the sitter space or cosmology in general. And that there have been various hypotheses people have made, but they are not as solid, I would say, or not as, we don't have um, as much evidence as we have for the case of black holes. So uh, you could make the hypothesis that, um, you could make the hypothesis that in the sitter space, uh, all the physics is described by a system whose entropy is proportional to the area of the horizon. Um, and uh, well, that, that might be uh, something you might, hypothesize. Uh, as I said, the computation of the fine grain entropy seems to uh, contradict that, but well, perhaps uh, still is compatible. So it's, it's a little murky, a little less clear. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is this other question. What was the use of considering a collapsing star? Could we do this type of calculations with just a simple black hole or other geometries? 
Um, so the, the point of the collapsing star is uh, first that is a simple initial condition that does not contain a black hole that then forms a black hole, right? Second is that is something that occurs in nature, perhaps not the simple spherical collapse, but uh, something somewhat similar. Uh, and that uh, historically was, uh, you know, shown to shown to be a mechanism by which a black hole can form. When Trashall found his solution, it wasn't clear that uh, that's an object that can form through a reasonable process. And, and the last part was, so can you do these calculations with a simple black hole or other geometries? Um, well, I'm not sure what you mean by a simple black hole. So the the these calculations uh, involve a, an evaporating black hole, or they are non-trivial for an evaporating black hole. Uh, as I mentioned, you can so if you consider a simple black, the simplest black hole is the um, the Schwarzschild solution, including the semi-classical corrections, and uh, we have said that in that case uh, we can do the calculation, and indeed uh, we find that the fine grain entropy is equal to the area of the horizon. So we don't get something fundamentally new in this case. We get the same thing that you know was calculated by Gibbons and Hawking and so on. You can, but you can do the calculation. Uh, the interesting thing is to do it in other situations, situations where you have an evaporating black hole or the black hole that formed from collapse or other situations that are not uh, in equilibrium. Okay. okay, thank you. Let's see if this is a if there is a follow up question. Are there Okay, I'll see one question over YouTube. So how does the temperature vary in the semi-classical approximation? Does it change for different frames and different types of black holes? Um, well, the, the, the uh, let me see. The, the, the temperature is uh, defined in the rest frame. So the, even for an ordinary fluid, the, the temperature is defined in some rest frame. Um, um, so um, the, if you have a black hole and you have radiation coming out of it, you can, this radiation would have some kind of black body spectrum that you could use to define the temperature. This statement is not completely precise because there are some great body factors. Um, so um, if you want to define the temperature in a completely formal way, in a more precise way, you would have to use uh, some kind of fluctuation dissipation theorem and uh, think about the uh, co various correlation functions uh, as a function of time and their relationship. Um, okay, that's how in practice you define the temperature. Um, now, what result do you get for the temperature? Well, the, the, the temperature will be inversely proportional to the radius. So as, as the black hole evaporates, the radius becomes smaller, the temperature becomes higher uh, for a black hole. So, I mean, so some of some aspects of the question could be raised even for the temperature of, uh, you know, a, a radiating piece of uh, coal, right? So you have some hot uh, piece of coal, it's radiating and then you can, as how you do you measure that temperature? So that that's that's involves the same conceptual difficulties as measuring the entropy of a black hole. Okay, thank you. There is this other question. As you say, a posteriori one doesn't need string theory nor ADS-EFT to compute the entropy. No. To know this, to know the state of the radiation, do you expect to need string theory ADS-EFT or not? Well, currently the ADS-EFT is the only way we know how to compute that state. Um, I, I hope that we'll understand the bulk theory well enough uh, that eventually we will not need it or that we'll have another description that is purely in terms of bulk uh, quantities and bulk concepts uh, that allows us to compute the, the states themselves. So this is... Uh, one, let's say, this is a hope. Now, some people have the idea that you'll never be able to do that and that the, the bulk concepts are intrinsically approximate, that there is some approximation that you do when you talk the, talk about the bulk concepts and you you will never be able to have another description. So that's, uh, that, that's another point of view. I, I, I hope the, the first one is the, the, 
the better one. But the, the first one is the one we'll have and hopefully, and then because that, if we had that, then that would be something that would be able to generalize to other situations like the sitter, or, you know, that are more relevant for, to our universe. Thank you. I see, I think Nicolas Vernal has a question. Yes, thank you very much Juan, for the very nice talk. So, um, so the, the black holes are evaporating, right? So they're suppose a, a small one, they're shrinking, uh, the temperature increases, but at some point it has to stop, right? I mean, I don't think- Yeah, so can... the temperature increases all the way to the, to, to the Planck scale, right? And that happens when the black hole has um, a mass of order of the Planck mass. And here we're making, so in the diagrams that I made and so on, I, I, we, one makes the hypothesis that when it gets to this point, it very quickly evaporates and it emits some final number of quanta, which is of, have an energy for the Planck and the black hole disappears completely. So we, we made that uh, like hypothesis. But, but by the time you get to this point, the black hole doesn't have a lot of uh, entropy. Now I should emphasize that that's, so here I'm kind of apologizing a little bit, but um, that was the advantage of uh, this page discussion. So in order to, um, to have this page discussion, you don't have to say exactly what happens at the end. So we, we are now discussing the end point of the black hole evaporation, but Paige pointed out that we have this contradiction when the black hole is, could be very big. So, um, you know, he, here the black hole might have uh, shrunk to a fraction of its initial size, but it's a finite fraction, maybe it's half or maybe a quarter of the initial size. So it could be very big. And so semi-classical physics continues to be a reasonably good approximation in this whole region. And uh, so forth. And, and, and the discussion we had about computing the entropy of the Hawking radiation is also valid in this region. The, the formulas we discussed are not valid in this very last uh, points, this very last regions, but they are valid uh, everywhere here. In particular, they are valid after the time where we expected to find the contradiction. And, and these formulas resolve that contradiction. When I have a question, since you, you are here. Oh, sorry, Nicolas. No, 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 thank you. I was just saying thanks. So there are there are a few time scales that you have mentioned. So one of them is the scrambling time that is um, and then we know that the second external surface appears after this time, and then there is the page time. But then what I, is at, at a time in between them is when you make a transition between considering the first extremal surface to the second, or how are those times? Yeah, I, yeah. I didn't quite describe, I didn't quite talk about the scrambling time. So um, I, I mainly this talk talked about this page time, which is when the two are equal. Um, that scrambling time appears in the details of uh, when the other extremal surface uh, exists. Uh, so let me. Uh, where was that? No. A little further earlier. Okay, so here um, we discussed that sometimes there is this surface. I didn't, I didn't give the details of where the surface was, um, but if you, if you take a, a light ray that comes out of the surface and goes to the this cutoff surface and you ask uh, what is the time difference between this time and that time, um, it turns out that, that that difference is a time which is logarithmic in the entropy. Um, and so it, it, it becomes large when the entropy becomes large, but not, not very fast. So somehow only logarithmically. So, so it's not a, from the point of view of this talk, it's not a very long time. So I completely ignored it in this discussion. Uh, but if you are care about the details and people do care about these details and they're important for some other things which I didn't discuss here, um, then uh, that's the definition of that time. But it didn't play a, a role in this discussion. Great, I think. Is there any other question here? We are way past the hour. Uh, I don't see any other question. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask a general question I typically ask, which is, uh, what are your recommendations to younger generations? What should they study in order to like make contributions in this field and any general advice you might want to give to young scientists? 
Well, I think uh, you should be curious and understand the basic, uh, the big picture of the problems you are working on. You're, you'll probably be working in a very specific problem, very narrow area. And usually that will almost always be the case that you are all, all, always working in a very specific problem, but you should always keep in mind the big picture of how that problem fits into the whole uh, you know, scientific enterprise, you know, into the bigger, bigger and bigger areas of what, uh, how we are planning to advance knowledge. Um, don't, 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 certainly you have to concentrate on that problem to make progress, but don't concentrate to the extent that you completely ignore where that problem fits in the whole, yeah, the whole building of science. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you everyone for joining us today. This is the, uh, as I said, our webinar 150th that finishes our current season. And then the next season will start pretty soon. So stay tuned. We have talks by Ken Van Tulby, Ren Su, Steven Hanmeyer, Pisa Vendubarman, Rebecca Lin, Diego Portillo, and others lining up for the next season. So thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. And okay. see you thank next you. time.